Hello, everyone. Cool. Uh, let me just say this as a start. It's the first time ever I enter a conference and I don't feel awkward in a room full of one, one gender type, let's say. I'm very proud to be here today and having this diversity across. <laughs> Um, let me introduce myself my way. I am Rima Sama'an, a data architect from Microsoft Gulf. I help customers uh, unlock insights in their data uh, in, in various industries that we will walk through right now. I will let Daniela introduce herself. Hi, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. I'm Daniela Colombo. I'm focusing on advanced analytics, which means for Microsoft, machine learning and deep learning. Cool. Will this work? Okay, perfect. Uh, so our topic to today is gonna be applied data science in the industries. We want to break the stereotype that data science in general and whoever works in data science are those introverts who work in the corner, who run machine and models, and you know nobody interacts with them. On the contrary, machine learning and data science and data analytics in general is very, very cool. And we're gonna walk through all those scenarios that make it more cool and, and we're gonna just discuss what Microsoft is doing across the region and how are we enabling our customers eventually to apply data science across different industries. Just to put the frame for our presentation, um, data science, uh, sorry, uh, business is being transformed in three major ways. The rise of big data, big data now is everywhere. Uh, data is being read from internet of things, from social media, from customer analytics, you know, all kinds of information. Opa, sorry. <laughs> The second is the maturity of cloud computing, which enables you know, crunching and slicing and dicing of this big data and applying machine learning and data science algorithms on top of it, which lead to the age and era of intelligence, and hence what we tag it nowadays as the fourth industrial revolution that we are in nowadays. So those three trends are shaping the industry, and uh, they're tagging the industries, and they're tagging the enterprises nowadays to be the intelligent enterprises. So there are a lot of studies that say, Actually, if those, if those uh, enterprises do not embrace this digital revolution or the fourth industrial revolution, they will be out of the market very, very soon. Why? For one main reason, because if those enterprises will only stay asking the questions of what happened and why did it happen, rather than what may happen or what will happen, and how do I think, for example, to generate what should happen or what shall I do next, then they will definitely be out of the business with all those categories that we will be talking <coughs> about. Next, I will hand over to my colleague, Daniela. So we want to take a little bit of step back because everybody was speaking about machine learning, deep learning, neural nets, but what are we really talking about? So first of all, machine learning is trying to solve some questions, answer some specific questions, and we can divide them into main classes. The first one is supervised, which means that we are creating our model based on the ground truth. So we know exactly that you belong to class A or class B, which means answering a classification problem, or we know that given a specific behavior, we are out of this range, so we kind of facing an anomaly. This is a, a scenario, for example, for IoT, where we want to identify anomaly detection and do predictive maintenance. Or we have data to do some sort of forecasting, your regression, which means how can I estimate how much and how many of my uh, objects are going to sell within the next few months. But then it comes to, uh, for example, clustering, which is an unsupervised uh, technique. Because given uh, the, the people listening to the speech, how many groups can we divide each other? That's a no ground truth uh, answer. I could decide that we are gonna divide by 10, or that she's gonna think she's gonna divide by eight. So that's a, those two are techniques that machine learning can help you solve. But is machine learning able to deal with all the data outside? Well. Kind of, kind of not, because when it comes to image processing, when it comes to text recognition, so voice recognition, well, the classical machine learning is not gonna answer your questions. And then we move into deep learning. Deep learning is not really a new field of studies. It's been there since 1940s. But what is changing now is that we have access to more compute power, 
We are training our models no more on CPUs, but we use GPUs, which allows us to run the algorithms much faster and being able to train more uh, the bigger data sets. In this case, uh, it's how we discretize an image in order to recognize uh, the different patterns uh, that the images has in. But I will introduce you to this topic with a specific example. So let's suppose that my objective is to um, estimate if this is a two. So which digit is actually putting inside. And the idea is that I'm going to take a picture of the number, put it inside of my black box, and receiving a, um, a probability of this being a two or any one other digit. How does it work? So pretty much, I will have a set of inputs and a set of outputs. The set of inputs will be, in this case, is an image of 16 pixels times 16 pixels, so 256 uh, possible inputs which are labeled x1, x2, until the last one. And uh, I will say that if there is an ink present, then I will say it's one. If there's no ink, I will say it is zero. And then I will do the output. So I'm moving from a field that has 256 features into a vector of 10 possibilities. And uh, I will estimate the probability of uh, this picture being a specific digit. And in this case, it's digit number two. From a mathematical perspective, why is it complex, why is it deep, uh, and which kind of algorithms work? Uh, so deep uh, uh, neural networks uh, is uh, the main topic behind deep learning. Uh, there are many different ways of uh, um, creating and constructing uh, neural networks. Uh, deep means that we are um, including many, many other idle layers. So as more idle layers as you will add inside of your algorithms, as more deep it will be. And it's computationally expensive because we're dealing with multi-dimensions. So the function, which actually is going to estimate our neural network, moves from R256 to R10. And that's just using a simple image, a 16 by 16 pixel. And image recognition is now well done. There are many open source algorithms that you can work on. What is now the new challenge in the image is actually object detections. So giving a image, uh, I want the machine to recognize what is inside. But both machine learning and uh, um, deep learning are actually applied within the field and in the business. Uh, I will cover both the banking and the research, and then Rima will conclude that we travel and retail. So what we were doing in the banking, I pretty much cover uh, the Europe countries, and uh, this is what I'm seeing most uh, common uh, within the banking field. So from a machine learning perspective, risk management and fraud analysis uh, is uh, very key. Uh, what the, um, the bank is doing is very similar to the retail. So I want to identify my good customers, those that will pay back my lo the loan that I'm giving to them, those that are going to send their salary within the bank, and they're going to invest, and tailor like also personalizations uh, uh, offers within uh, the bank. Then uh, uh, for a fraud analysis, it's very interesting. is uh, pretty much a classification problem, almost a near real-time classification problem, because every time we do a transaction, behind there is an algorithm that authorize your transaction based on specific, uh, specific like data that uh, the, um, the POS or the banking is sharing. And in this case, with the likelihood, it's going to say yes, approve the transaction or reject the transactions. Um, then we do, obviously, forecasting and stock exchange and portfolio optimizations. That's been done both uh, with uh, uh, machine learning and deep learning. But what's really interesting, and I work in this with a bank in the Netherlands, is that they have a bot framework, which is actually artificial intelligence. And they want these uh, uh, virtual assistants to act in a way it was like human being. And in that case, we are using a neural network that is based on uh, processing natural language. And uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting how to see how the, the bot is learning based also on how the uh, customer is, is asking different questions and how it's engaging with uh, uh, the, uh, the people. Um, the, the goal of uh, the artificial intelligence is to make the machine as more similar to us as possible. And it's very nice field of research, and, but it's also a great application for the industry outside. 
Then uh, within uh, the coverage of the education sector, I am working now for in those three main topics, uh, which is uh, audio detections, uh, metagenomics uh, for precision medicine, and uh, object detections. Uh, for the audio analysis, it's actually with uh, the biomaritmin, maritmine, and they want to, um, they are listening to the wheel sounds, identify male and female, how they move uh, within the oceans, that's uh, going to tell them how the migration is affected by the global changes of the climate, uh, which is very interesting from a uh, biomaritmine biological perspective. The metagenomics analysis is uh, actually been used uh, to study uh, the DNA for uh, precision medicine. This morning we had big talks about it, and uh, as you now know, it's very important. It's actually one of the fields where big data is really present. We are working closely with the FDA, and for just this project, we have more than uh, 100 terabytes of data. And the last one is uh, uh, pretty much the uh, object detections. So uh, as I mentioned before into the deep learning, um, object recognition within an image is something that we now can solve. But object detection is something that is more complex. It requires both deep learning and machine learning techniques together. And when you're dealing with images that are a gray, um, scale of grays and where boundaries are not well defined, the algorithm gets even more complex. Uh, uh, so so um, this uh, research uh, customer is uh, um, convoluting like both uh, physicists, physicians, uh, mathematicians, statisticians, uh, and computer science uh, to work together. Um, what I've been seeing from my experience, and uh, I, I hope I can transmit this to you, is that it's a really a team effort. I'm a mathematician, but obviously I don't know everything that medicine does, and I really work closer to the team, and, or, and also with the computer science. Um, another good topic is all of the projects I did were in the cloud. Uh, not because it's Microsoft per se, but because it allows you to spin up machines and have compute patterns in no time. So you don't have to go to procurement, get an hardware, and install everything. Everything is already there, and you can start to play and find your analytics uh, uh, in, in zero time. But obviously, uh, we have more example, and I pass uh, to Rima to continue to the travel and aviation. Thank you. So tapping into the travel and aviation, aviation industry, I have been extensively working with different airlines, airports, and uh, travel industry in the Gulf specifically uh, to untap insights from their data and use extensively machine learning in that area. Um, Okay, so data-driven travel. One of the key areas that they're trying to, uh, to tap over these days is, is profile their customers, try to understand customers, customer behaviors from social media, from previous purchases of their ticketing. For example, if you have browsed their website, for example, a couple of days ago, and you showed interest, for example, in traveling to uh, exotic islands or you know, traveling to the Caribbean, what is the probability using machine learning if they can address to you a customized offer going to Cuba, for example, or Costa Rica, and sending it directly to you or to her. So profiling customers and trying to understand customer behaviors based on social media trends, based on website trends, how do you interact with their website and personalization is key in the travel industry. Um, another sector in travel uh, and aviation is basically operations. So uh, one of the key areas leveraging Internet of Things and data science in specific is combining the two together to uh, maximize their operations and being proactive in their operations rather than being reactive. We have been touched base before in the previous of uh, uh, panelists and, sp and speaks before about the importance of IoT and the predictive maintenance of airplanes. What we have done across in various airlines, we have been collecting, gathering data, uh, telemetry data actually from the, from the actual airplanes and through historical data we are able to tap and predict when will those parts them probably they might actually fail so that we can raise flags that those might probably fail. Please, let's do proactive maintenance. And by doing this proactive maintenance, uh, airlines and hence airports will be, will be cost saving in two areas. One, they will be cost saving Rather, they will, be in, they will be proactively, let's say, uh, maintaining that rather than repairing the piece itself, and thus they, serve, they save cost. And two, they save cost of delays, in the sense that 
whenever an airplane lands in an airport and there is a sudden fault in one of its parts, then that will cause delays across. And by doing that, they will minimize delays and they will optimize their operations accordingly. And this has been leveraged a lot in the region and worldwide. We're partnering with airlines, we're partnering with the engines, we're with engines who manufacture that in order to, to cater for such kind of things. And this is basically an example where we were actually reading the black box data in that, in that engine. Um, and we, can, we are able to tag the flights and we are able to tag the planes themselves and where they are specifically and raise a flag that, hey, you need a proactive maintenance directly because based on historical data, those faults might cause a direct fault in your engine or a direct fault in any part. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of aviation uh, partners are using that nowadays. Questions? Go on. All good? Great. Okay. The next one, which I was deeply involved in, is in flight operations, is what we call gate planning. Now, this is one of the most interesting topics that I had no idea it was a science by itself, but apparently, um, uh, assigning a plane to a gate is not random at all at the airport. Rather, it's a science by itself. Assigning a plane to a gate is not that let's assign it to the first nearest gate that is available. On the contrary, assigning it to the gate, it means compatibility with that gate. It means solving the problem of where shall I park that airplane in the sense that those connecting passengers in that airplane will walk the minimal distance to get to the next connecting flight. And our team of data scientists have been solving this algorithm across with various airlines and airports in order to solve that. Apparently, this was random before, and it was based on intuition, and intuition was working good, until we came into the picture and we were helping them to automate that process and optimize their operations. And operations were really, really optimized this way, in the sense that connectivity and flight delays were minimized big time in that, <coughs> in that case scenario. Apart from talking about how can we predict flight delays based on weather conditions, based on um, you know, wind condition, based on social media events that are happening across the world, for example, if there is a strike in Charles de Gaulle Airport, uh, operations will have to cater for how can they manage their, uh, their operations and ground fleet in order to cater for that, let's say, strike across. So different kind of machine learning algorithms that were applied across this industry uh, that is really, really cool. And hence, machine learning and a cool industry knowledge can really make magic. Science actually, not magic. Okay. <laughs> the last but not least is that I want to tap into data science in retail in specific. This is the dearest to my heart because it's really fun to work with and you know, you have uh, lim unlimited scenarios to work with. What we have been doing, well, first of all, let's talk about data science in retail. Retailers nowadays uh, are expected to target people customized in a customized way, in a personalized way, in a targeted way. I do not accept anymore any retailer that I log into air online, for example, or I go to the shops and register to the loyalty cards to send me irrelevant information. For example, to send me information that there's discount on kids for, uh, clothes for kids, whereas I don't have kids. This is irrelevant information, and probably I might churn out from them. However, I do appreciate if I log into their website, giving my credentials and knowing that I'm a customer, that I was very, very interested the day before with a new phone that they have released. Probably the next day, they might send me a specialized, personalized offer that, hey, if you go and grab it online today, you will have a 20% discount. That I would appreciate, and this is how the retail industry is shaping the new personalization and is shaping the new, let's say, society. <clears throat> So given that, uh, personalization is the key operational uh, uh, in data science uh, across that, and it's, it's, uh, it's shaping the world in a different way in personalization in specific. One case scenario that I have been working with across the Gulf is the mall connectivity, or what we call the connected shopping mall. So uh, what we have done with that mall is that, uh, first of all, the mall wanted to know what is the mall footprint, in the sense that 
based on Wi-Fi connectivity and based on beacons inside the mall. Once you walk in and you connect to that mall, we can actually specify, not, not you as a person, where are you going, but based on general telemetry that has been sent from those hotspots, we can know what are the hot paths inside this mall. We can identify what are those hot areas. We can identify what are the peak hours in the mall. We can eventually predict from just this simple information from telemetry what are the peak hours, when is going to be a crowded place, and thus they can... <clears throat> They can mobilize in supply chain, they can mobilize in inventory management, uh, restaurants in the restaurants in the mall uh, basically can cater for that and they can actually shape that accordingly where they can know what are the peak hours so that they can do that. The next step after that, once you know the path and the telemetry, you can actually know based on historical data and based on the mobile app, if you have the mall app, I can know, oh, yesterday you have logged into our website and you have, <clears throat> let's say, um, viewed this uh, boost or this mobile phone. How about if you walk in the next day in the mall and while logging in into your application, I know that this is you and how about I give you a direct personalized offer at the right time that, hey, if you walk into that shop, maybe if you go in, we'll have a 20% discount if you go and grab that phone, for example, or that boots or so ever. So this is a scenario that we have been working on in the UAE with one of the biggest malls around. <laughs> and basically, we have analyzed the data, the peak hours, what are the peak hours. We have projected the mall map and what are the hotspot areas. And ironically, once they knew what are the hotspot footprints, the rent of those areas have gone up, right? So they want to maximize the profit accordingly. And then we have forecasted what are the peak hours at the end of the day. <laughs> and forecasted in the future uh, when, will, when are the busiest mall, when are the busiest peak hours based on historical data and seasonality. And then you are targeting them with those personalized mobile campaigns. So we analyzed, analyzed, predicted, and personalized. One last thing to say is that with data science, in every industry, really, you can do a lot of things. So had it been in retail, manufacturing, services, health, even government, really, the sky is your limit. All what you need to know is some industry expertise, data, and, of course, science. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you.